Oh, welcome, Kathleen. Thanks for joining me for today with this interview. I really appreciate you being here. It's uh, it's wonderful to have you part of our one of our PLT live sessions. So we're going to be talking about um, neo-humanism and a little bit about, you know, which I find you to be quite the expert in, <laughs> in education. So again, um, and before we get started, if you could just tell us a little bit about you, a little bit of your background, um, especially for those that have not um, had an opportunity to see one of your courses or read one of your books. Uh, well, you know, it gets harder and harder to be brief the older you get. So I'll try to just be really relevant to our discussion, uh, which is I'm a recently retired professor emerita of teaching, learning, and leadership. I spent uh, almost 40 years in higher education before that, I taught children and was very involved in the, the free school and alternative education movement in the 1970s, starting in the 1970s. So uh, I really have been spending the last four years um, trying to sort of refine and work out the real details of neo-humanist education. I first came into contact with uh, Astanga Yoga and the ideas of uh, Prabhat Ranjan Sarkar in 1971, and uh, was very inspired by the 1982 book, Liberation of Intellect, uh, Neo-Humanism, Liberation of Intellect, and uh, have sort of followed what neo-humanist educators have been doing for the past 30 years or so. So currently, I'm involved in, um, we created a program for teacher education. It's a two-year program in neo-humanist education, and we just graduated our first cohort, our two-year cohort. Christy was a part of that. And we have started a new court cohort of about 38 people. And I am also completing a textbook for the course, um, which should go to the publisher, Information Age Publishing, in a couple of weeks so we're hoping to have it out by the end of the year fantastic yeah i'm looking forward to that textbook <laughs> and what an amazing course that was so to our interview um what is neo-humanism and how does it differ from traditional educational philosophies uh, good question well first of all to clarify Neo-humanism itself isn't an educational philosophy. It's really an extension of uh, the important aspects of humanism, which is a which is a philosophy which has been around for the last few hundred years. Um, but neo-humanist education then is sort of a, an extrapolation of the ideas from neo-humanism applied to education. So maybe uh, to just talk about humanism for a moment, uh, sort of the main ideas of it, it started in like the 1400s. Renaissance humanism sort of happened around the same time as the Enlightenment, the Renaissance and then the Enlightenment. And it really sort of was a philosophy that released people in the Western world from centuries of really dogmatic and oppressive uh, spirituality, religion, not spirituality, but religion. Uh, and it emphasized the importance of uh, rationalism or rational thinking of the human individual. Science really began in earnest, empirical science and technological development. Uh, there was a new interest in human inquiry and self-reflection, uh, new values, the idea of democracy began to be born, um, and human rights grew out of that. So there was a real belief in personal and social growth and uh, the idea of progress. So that, that all came about with humanism. Now, that, that was the sort of positive aspect of humanism. There were a few um, really important failings, I think, of humanism, which were just beginning to really come to grips with, and in fact, which provide the incentive for the philosophy of neo-humanism, which really means new humanism. Along with uh, 
humanistic um, philosophy came capitalism um, because as, as uh, there began to be industrial and technological development, capitalism developed as, a, as the economic system alongside of it. And of course, capitalism is devoted to the notion of, of increasing production, progress, and uh, economic growth. Along with capitalism developed colonialism, which was the, um, you know, countries had always fought and conquered and, you know, done all sorts of things. But there was a really systematic effort on the part of uh, European countries to colonize um, the rest of the world, really, Africa, Asia, Latin America. And it was really the quest for continuing source of raw materials and resources to fuel the engines of this new industrial era. And of course, along with colonialism, we had the, the tragedies of enslavement, of genocide, of the removal of Native people from their lands, etc. Um, also, you know, there was a sociologist named Max Weber about 100 years ago who talked about the ways that science, for all of its uh, wonderful things that it has brought about, contributed to what he called the disenchantment of the world. And this is sort of the elimination of all the, the magic and the mystery, the beauty, the spirituality, um, because science was thought to be uh, the great explanatory principle. So we have a disenchanted world. We have the tragedies of colonialism. And now that there aren't a whole lot of colonies left in the world, we have really an economic imperialism in which a very few uh, corporate entities really control the future of the planet. And as many people will say, it's brought us to kind of a tipping point environmentally and economically. I will say that there's a, there's a phrase that I think is really important called human exceptionalism. And it's really this idea that humans are very different from all other organisms because we have uh, language, culture, and free will. And uh, a belief that all problems can be solved by human ingenuity. So you may have heard the phrase, man is the measure of all things. This is really the, the centering of the human being at the very top of the pyramid of creation. Um, what's interesting is we are exceptional, I think, in some ways because of uh, language, because of cognition. But we're also exceptional in that we now have the capacity to destroy all life on Earth. So um, I think that uh, gives humanity a really special responsibility. Uh, and neo-humanism essentially challenges this idea of human exceptionalism. Uh, it doesn't say humans are doomed or humans are evil. It just reminds us that we are part of the great web of life. We're not necessarily at the pinnacle of it. Uh, that's the short the sh maybe not the short answer to humanism and neo-humanism. But neo-humanism essentially says we don't need to throw these ideas of justice and dignity and human worth away. We just need to extend the principles of humanism to all of creation. So there's this idea in neo-humanism that it's important to cultivate a love for animate and inanimate, inanimate life. You know, we need to create the sort of uh, large love for all creation so that we can maybe turn around uh, this process that's happening where we're destroying so much of life on Earth. What a, what a powerful message and what a responsibility we do carry. <laughs> um, so honestly, you know, I feel like I kind of, fell upon um you know this this you were talking earlier about this two-year course of neo human teachers and um like i said it was an incredible course and it's been life-changing for me um 
And so in your opinion, why do you, we, do you think we need more neo-humanist educators in today's rapidly changing world? Well, I, <laughs> rapidly changing is certainly true. You and I have both been very close to very recent disasters, and we've seen the devastation that has been wrought by global warming and climate change. Uh, some of your listeners may have heard the word Anthropocene. Uh, scholars and scientists, uh, many of them agree that we've entered a new geological era, which means that this last cycle, this 10,000 years of the Holocene, has allowed civilizations to flourish. But because of um, humanity's, a portion of humanity, a very small portion, not all of humanity, but say 1% of humanity who are um, really behind the, the, the extraction, the rapacious um, extraction of minerals, of fossil fuels, um, nu of nuclear power. We are really uh, beginning a new era in which the human impacts may have um, destroyed much of life on Earth. We're dealing now with species extinction, with pollution, with ecocide, and also with uh, very human uh, problems of conflict, of war, of racism. Sri Sarkar talked about uh, the human sentiments and the way that humans, first of all, care for their own self, their own family, their own caste, their own tribe, their own clan, um, th their own territory, their own nation state, their religion. So we have all these sentiments where we're very attached to particular labels and particular identities. But he said that um, humanity needs to uh, transcend these limited sen sentiments and develop more of a universal, what we talked about, the universal care for all of creation. And right now, I think we're seeing um, what happens when humans are really stuck in these very narrow identities. We see polarization. We see the sort of um, balkanization of uh, ethnicities. Uh, gender battles, uh, people are really sort of not moving into a more universal sentiment. So that, I think, because neo-humanist education is devoted to the process of helping people move through these limited sentiments is a pretty good reason why we need more neo-humanist teachers and neo-humanist education in the world. So we've talked kind of about the differences between, you know, neo-humanism and traditional educational philosophies. We've talked a little bit about the necessities for these educators. So what are some of the key principles or values that neo-humanist educators prioritize in their teaching approach that makes them different? Great question. And uh, the whole book is about that. So I'll try to distill it down to a few principles. I think the first one is that uh, neo-humanist educators are taught to recognize what I call the multidimensionality of both themselves and of their students. So while conventional education really focuses on uh, the intellect, um, neo-humanist education recognizes the holistic nature of the child, the body, the importance of the body and the care of the body, the intellect, but also aesthetics and creativity and intuition and what we call the sort of higher human faculties. So it is an educational process that applies to a larger spectrum of human capacities. Uh, there's an ecological dimension to neo-humanist education too. It really understands the human being as deeply interconnected with everything else um, in a kind of a relational sense to the rest of creation. And it arranges for everything to be studied in this relational context, whether we're talking about science or history or mathematics. Um, Neo-humanist education uh, does not sort of hide the fact that it is a kind of a character education. It attempts to educate young people in, you know, what are pretty commonly accepted 
virtues. Um, and that, that's something that we could talk about in more depth, but it really does aim to help children understand how to talk about ethics in this new sort of neo-humanist paradigm. How do you have ethical conversations? How do you cultivate this love for all living beings? And how do, uh, you know, it builds on some of the ideas of social emotional intelligence. You know, how do we create the sort of deep empathy that really is a new way of being in the world? Um, part of how this is accomplished is because uh, uh, contemplative spirituality is sort of at the core of neo-humanist education. So um, I've been reading a lot lately about a lot of the research on meditation and, uh, and yoga, for example. And it really is pretty clear that it's a primary way that people begin to develop this kind of empathy. Um, so neo-humanism promotes the sort of the exploration of the inner world or the inner life of the child. It, it, wants it to be balanced with the exploration of the outer world. And that's something that's very different. And again, we talked about the sentiments and uh, neo-humanist education is very dedicated to um, freeing the mind from dogma, from superstition, um, from conspiracy theories. You know, it really focuses on teaching people how to be critical thinkers, how to think rationally. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting integration, which I don't think has really happened before, of a deep spirituality, um, but also of the principles of decolonizing education and critical pedagogy, which are much more sort of radical social justice approaches. So um, we don't generally see that integration. Often we see like very holistic, spiritually oriented schools or social justice schools, but very few uh, educational environments really bring those things together. And one of the ways that neo-humanist schools really sort of operationalize this empathy that's developed through, through um, inner work is through a real commitment to service. And the service can be to the community, it can be to animals, uh, it can be to the environment, but it's, it's really fostered throughout the educational process is this idea of serving. Yeah, such a value, um, especially with service. It's something we've talked a lot about even within the planetary leadership training. Um, I think in our 99 days course, we had an entire module on just service. Mm -hmm. And so it, there is, it's so important. And um, so we live in a very diverse world. Um, so how does neo humus education address the diverse needs and backgrounds of the students in a multicultural society? Uh -huh. That's a really interesting question um, because globalization with all the problems that it's brought has really brought cultures into much closer contact with each other through migration, through dislocation, through all sorts of, just through travel. Um, so I think pe people are becoming much more aware of culture as a sort of really important aspect of, um, of education. I think that what's important about Sarkar's philosophy is the sort of radical equality that he is promoting between and amongst cultures. He's really trying to move us away from the dominator idea where some cultures are developed and they're up here, other cultures are undeveloped or primitive or tribal, they're down here, and it's up to these higher cultures to civilize the lower cultures. That was the central premise of colonialism. But Sarkar has um, been very, been very, um, has emphasized the idea of, of cultural uh, importance, the radical equality of all humans. And in this sense, for example, neo-humanist educators globally 
one of the principles is that education should take place in the local language rather than the imposed colonial language. This doesn't um, preclude the importance of students learning what's called the link language or a lingua franca. At this point in time, it's probably English. So um, that's important too, because it really is uh, a language of power. But uh, the importance of, of local culture, of local customs, of really creating an educational opportunity that values the expressions of the local culture and language. So I think uh, that's one of the ways that neo-humanist education uh, addresses diversity. I've, um, you know, we have, I've worked with you on this uh, with the place-based programs, place-based education, especially coming from somewhere like the Hawaiian Islands, where there's such a, a strong, beautiful culture there that's trying to revive itself. Um, the idea of language and um, and then I guess this kind of draws me into the next question too because you know something that when I was studying there a lot there was there was um, already a understanding of their relationship with the land and you know we're we're in this kind of you know you talked about it earlier and our these our children um, all of us are in a world where we're facing um, you know in a lot of environmental changes quickly and disasters that are occurring daily and also we're talking a lot about sustainability so how can neo-humanist education play a promoting role in environmental consciousness and sustainability uh -huh. well i guess if you start from the principle that <clears throat> neo-humanist <clears throat> is about developing a love for all creation not a sentimental love but a really sort of i guess one word is agape that sort of universal love then care of the environment is going to be sort of uh really central to it um it's interesting because a lot of modern people are people who are born and raised in industrial technological cultures of course, we know that young people spend an inordinate amount of time um, on screens. They're looking at their smartphones or their iPads or watching television. So much of what they're learning about life is mediated by technology. And Richard Louvre wrote a lovely little book about the nature deficit disorder. And I think we're coming to understand that when people are removed from land and removed from nature, uh, they don't develop that sense of care for the earth. So neo humanist educators are, are uh, very aware that uh, a lot of education needs to take place outdoors to a great extent. So there's a, a real emphasis on like forest education, you know, what can we learn from being outdoors of gardening, of agroecology, of all of the sort of outdoor activities um, are, are extremely important. So I think it, uh, it really is, let's see, let me think what I'd like to say here. It follows in many ways the principles of deep ecology. <clears throat> if you look at the work of Arnie Nace and Duvall and Sessions and people like that, but in many deep ecologists, there was kind of an anti-human sentiment, this idea that really the planet would be much better without us. Um, and to some extent, that might be true. The planet might be able to heal itself if all human activity were removed. But neo-humanist education really doesn't go there. It really speaks to the, the interdependence of humans and their environment, um, and much more of an emphasis on really spending time in nature and um, working in the natural world rather than learning about the natural world. And I, I will mention now there's a new report out. Uh, it was a report commissioned by UNESCO on the future of education. And it's called uh, Becoming With the World. So the whole report is really advocating for 
a, really a new way, a new ontology, a new way of being in the world that uh, is really fosters a sense of being part of the world rather than being apart from the world and observing it. And of course, um, you know, we've spent hundreds of years getting to this point where we feel that we're viewing the world objectively. So it's a really big leap to again become immersed in the world and to feel like an interdependent part of it. I don't underestimate uh, the distance we have to go to sort of cross that bridge. So we're talking about learning. We're talking about, you know, what neo humans education educators, you know, the what they can do. But how do neo human educators also promote a lifelong love for learning and growth mindset among their students? Well, um, I don't think you can promote something unless you embody it. So we put a real emphasis on teacher development in our program. And I'm sort of convinced that students may forget virtually everything you teach them, but they will remember who you were. They will remember the kind of person you were, and they will have absorbed uh, lessons about life and development from the characteristics that you have as a teacher. So um, we really place, a, you know, I place a very strong emphasis on teachers themselves being lifelong learners. In fact, that's one of the most wonderful things about being a teacher is the opportunity to keep studying and uh, to keep growing. But uh, you talked, did you, you mentioned a growth mindset? Yes. And um, it's interesting, that's kind of a popular term right now. And what it basically means is we're trying to help students understand that <clears throat> they're not born smart, uh, <laughs> that intelligence is something that can be cultivated and that it's cultivated through effort. Uh, so the growth mindset is, is used to sort of convince students that mistakes are okay and um, everybody makes mistakes and we learn from them and to just keep trying to get better and better and better. But it also, I think we need to create different kinds of environment for learning. I think there are um, ways in which education, conventional education really works against uh, positive human development. You know, the, when you have a high stress environment with exams, when you have a curriculum that's disconnected facts it's disconnected from any experience when you have a curriculum that's irrelevant to students and i have to say if you talk to many students and ask them about school they say well it's not relevant it doesn't have anything to do with what i'm interested in so all of these things create a level of stress i think in education that prohibit a growth mindset they really they um they really lead to uh, some, well, some students are very successful and they graduate and go on and get high paying jobs and do quite well. Um, but many, many students simply turn off and they drop out of school. The dropout rate in the United States in some communities is 50% or more. So we need to create uh, educational environments that kids are excited about where they want to be and where it holds meaning and relevance for them. And then they will develop a lifelong love for learning and a growth mindset. But if you don't have an education that fosters meaning and relevance, who's going to want to do that for a, a lifetime? Sounds like a solid equation to me. <laughs> it, just makes, it makes common <laughs> sense to me. So somebody's sitting at home right now and they're hearing this or they're watching this. What type of skills, what are the key qualities and skills that aspiring new humanist educators should possess? What is What would be some that you'd pin that point out? Well, um, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, it's funny. There's years and years and years of research on teaching. 
and millions of dollars spent trying to figure out what constitutes good teaching. And some people even write books and say, these are the 40 things teachers need to know. Um, and there are certain things that are really important for teachers to know. Uh, they have to know some stuff. They have to know academic content. If you're going to teach history, you need to really uh, understand history or mathematics or whatever it is. Of course, uh, neo-humanism doesn't advocate a highly segregated separate subjects approach to learning. They really advocate more of a transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary approach to learning, recognizing that um, students' brains aren't separated into math and science and history. Their brains are, are more holistic than that. But anyway, uh, teachers need to know some stuff. They need to really have a strong interest in children and how they grow and develop. Uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of people who are very, very smart about lots of things, whether it's uh, nuclear science or, um, or mathematics or history, but they have no clue how to take what they know and translate that into ways of experiencing and learning that are appropriate to children. So teachers also need to really understand how children development, how children develop. They need to be able to sort of recapture their own experiences as a child and remember what it was to be a child. And they need to be really careful observers of children. Because um, if you don't really understand children, your teaching is not going to be successful. I think what's really important for neo-humanist educators is they really need to be filled with loving kindness and compassion, uh, intuition. Um, because, you know, we really are trying to create educational environments that that nourish the spirit of the child as well as just the intellect. Yeah, I, I think something you had brought up earlier, too, about you need to fully embrace neo-humanism in your own life and the way you, uh, well, you, yeah, I think that's, that's really important. And um, I love, I love the word love, <laughs> love, you know, I think, um, yeah, and I was just previously talking to you about spending some time with my young niece, and I was singing songs about love to her in the car. So it's just, uh, and just sitting back and observing, I think, is such a high, important quality also. It has so much right. value to it. So I And it is interpreted sort of superficially. It's like, oh, I love this movie, or I love pancakes, or I love this, or I love that. So I think maybe we need even a new word, you know, to, uh, <laughs> to get beyond the sort of romantic or sentimental mm -hmm. ideas of love. Um, but one thing that you mentioned that I sort of didn't emphasize, which is so true, in our program, <clears throat> part of the teacher development process is that they be involved in their own contemplative practice. And, of course, we feature Asanga Yoga. It's a very uh, kind of a universal approach to um, contemplative practice. But someone can also be a practicing Buddhist, a practicing Christian, it really, it doesn't matter the religion as long as you're on a path of inner development and inner inner knowing. So we, as individuals, or let, let's say we even have a teacher that's um, somebody that is already in education that's watching this, or so how can neo humus education be integrated into mainstream educational system to, to reach a larger larger group? larger, more students? That's a great question. And I talk a bit, a bit, a bit in the book about, uh, you know, there's been discussion of spirituality and education for many years recently, not religion, but the sort of uh, contemplative spirituality, the inner knowing. And people get very confused between what's the difference between spirituality <clears throat> and religion. And uh, this is a tough one, but there has been a holistic education movement for at least um, 30, 30 years now. In fact, I'm contributing to a new book that's coming out 
on holistic education that sort of documents its most recent iteration, which started in the 1980s. Um, so holistic education, the idea of cultivating wonder, awe, spiritual development, aesthetics, um, things like that, has been around for quite a while. Social justice education has also been around for quite a while. And the idea of, of cultivating social responsibility. Neither one of these things have been dominant in education, but they've both been very present in many mainstream schools. Uh, as I mentioned before, what has not happened is really a very seamless integration of these two aspects into a more comprehensive philosophy of education. But if you look at mainstream education, you can see aspects of neo-humanist education in cooperative learning, in social emotional learning, in restorative justice practices, in culturally relevant pedagogy. So there's bits and pieces already happening in mainstream education. And in fact, many schools even have yoga for children or, uh, you know, a small amount of time for um, like quiet time, like to go inward. Um, but to date, we haven't had a comprehensive philosophy that integrates uh, all the essential aspects of neo-humanism, um, including, as I said before, the unity of body, mind, and spirit, decolonizing education, social justice, critical pedagogy, ethics, and a real vision of the future that's grounded in peace and sustainability and joy. And in fact, I think all of education and per perhaps all of social change is this sort of roller coaster of progress and backlash and progress and backlash. So for in fact, the last 10 or so years, there's been a great deal of movement forward around social justice and anti-racist education and equity in schools. Um, uh, teachers really expanding their minds about all these issues and trying to bring them into the classroom in sensitive and developmentally appropriate ways. And now you see the incredible backlash um, from elements of society who really do not wish to see progress in those areas. So we have uh, legislation in 19 states against mentioning race or issues of sexuality or gender. Um, in classrooms, we have book bannings, uh, probably we'll have book burnings at some point, uh, which is really tragic, but it's very predictable. Every time people start moving toward uh, more humanistic, more developed, more uh, just um, ways of being in the world, there is a backlash from those elements of society who don't want to see that kind of progress. I hear you on that. Um, so uh, my last question was going to be about, do you have a advice or a message for educators or policymakers um, on how to implement new humanist principles in their educational institutions? Kind of, and maybe also a message of just um, uh, for us hopeful educators out here <laughs> that are here, the new generation and below me and younger than me um, right. want to take this role on that you've, successfully have done such a beautiful job for some, you know, for several decades? Well, first of all, I've, I've probably uh, taught and worked with <clears throat> hundreds, maybe even thousands at this point of new teachers. And I have a, a profound respect for teachers. Uh, I have, it, you know, in my f almost 40 years of teaching, I have occasionally met that student who's just in the wrong profession and needs to be doing something else. But for the most part, I find most teachers to really be caring, to really care about young people, to be very interested in young people and to want the best for them. And so it's, it's you know, I think if teachers had more latitude to teach from the heart, to do what they feel is right for students, that would be a big step right there. So it's really policies, policies and um, structural issues that prevent 
teachers from doing the kind of job they would really like to do. Like I have never met a teacher who was highly in favor of high stakes testing or rote memorization or disconnected curriculum. Almost every teacher I've met uh, believes that we need a more robust, holistic approach to learning. So that would be the first thing that I would say would be to, you know, recognize that it's a system that needs to be changed. <clears throat> but I also think that, uh, you know, people are less inclined to study and to read now than they were when I first started teaching 40 years ago. And I think that, and that's related to a lot of things, to social media, to, you know, hyperlinked learning, to sound bites, to the sort of shallowness of most media now. But I would really advise teachers to study, to study deeply, to read well. And, you know, I think in terms of implementing neo-humanism in schools, it's not really something that will be successful if you apply, apply it piecemeal, like it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, you really need to understand how all of the parts really create a larger whole. But the second thing about implementing is I don't think it can be successfully implemented from the top down. I have come to really value and understand the role of community participation in schools. How do you create uh, opportunities for engagement so that families and community organizations, teachers and students have opportunities to really share their dreams and their visions for a school and what they would like to see. So it sort of can come sort of from the ground up. Um, so I'm not sure. That's about all the advice I can think of right now. <laughs> no, it's fantastic, Kathleen. Thank you. And this whole interview has been um, just been fantastic, really insightful. And I have no doubt that, um, you know, there's going to be some uh, people <laughs> knocking at the at the at your door or something, you know, the new who's college about potentially wanting to sign up for. And that's the, I, that's the final thing is. Um, so I know the co the second cohort for the New Humans College of Asheville has already started for um, this next two years, and then so the next one will start in two years from now. Is that the the plan? Probably, unless we okay. can figure out a way to scale things up a little quicker, which would involve recruiting new faculty. <laughs> yes, for one thing, and uh, maybe figuring out some uh, different ways of uh, sort of spreading the message, whether that involves. Um, maybe not live courses, but video lectures mm -hmm. and maybe even self-paced curriculum. I think there's a lot of things we could do, but it does take capacity to do it. Of course, of course. Yeah. Well, thank you again for joining us today. Um, yes, just fantastic and really appreciate your insight and all your knowledge that you shared today. And uh, yeah, I, I'm inspired. And, <laughs> so, and you're inspiring, Christy. You're doing a lot of good work yourself. So well, thank you. I'm hoping you decide to become a teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it.